Hello, my name is McKenna Bryan and I have the great privilege of working with Women's Health Lodden Mallee. I'm feeling extra fortunate today to be partnering with Greater Bendigo Against Family Violence to bring to you what will no doubt be an intriguing session with Jess Hill. Women's Health Lodden Mallee acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, work and provide our services. We pay our respect to elders past and present and acknowledge their ongoing living cultures and the contributions they make to the life of this region. We recognise the strength and resilience of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and express our hope for reconciliation and justice. Always was, always will be. So welcome everybody to our conversation with Jess Hill. It's wonderful to have her with us for this 16 days event, which we are delighted to bring to you in partnership with Greater Bendigo Against Family Violence and the City of Greater Bendigo who have contributed time, effort and funding to bring this session together. We acknowledge and are thankful for the local leadership and commitment of Greater Bendigo Against Family Violence to prevent violence against women. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, the CEO of Women's Health Lodden Mallee, Prisha Carey. Thanks, McKenna. It's a truly terrific gathering. Each and every one of us today are engaged in a constant project. And when each and every one of us use what we know, where we are to do what we can, change happens. I'm paraphrasing there from um, Penny Wong, fabulous leader. And today I welcome and acknowledge Minister Gabriel Williams' leadership in supporting and encouraging us all to actively prevent violence against women and promote gender equality. Here's a word from the Minister. Thank you to Women's Health Lodden Mallee for organising this event and support of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Thanks for being part of a global commitment to address gender inequality and eradicate Thank you to Women's Health Lodden Mallee for organising this event in support of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Thanks for being part of a global commitment to address gender inequality and eradicate violence against women and girls. It's more important than ever that we do everything we can to prevent gendered violence. Research shows us that COVID-19 has created an international crisis for women's safety. And here in Australia, this came on top of immense pressures caused by the recent and devastating bushfires. One in 10 Australian women are reporting that they have experienced family violence during the pandemic, one third of these for the very first time. We know that the pandemic has intensified the underlying drivers of violence against women, which of course includes economic security and access to paid work. That's why during 16 days, the Victorian government is again focusing on our Respect Women Call It Out campaign. We're asking people to consider what respect means, what it looks like, and how to put it into practice in their everyday lives. I want to thank you for all the work you've done throughout this challenging year. We couldn't have done this work without you. Together, I know we can achieve a Victoria free from violence. We couldn't call it a Zoom event without a bit of a tech issue, could we? So that was great to get that ironed out, fantastic. Uh, Women's Health on Mallee really values the ministerial support we have for this work. And thank you, Tricia, for that introduction. Okay, a little bit of admin before we introduce Jess. We are about to post in the chat uh, information around some support services that you um, may find helpful given the themes of today's session. And if you find them confronting and would like to reach out for support, please do so as required. Also, please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions and to use the chat function to comment and respond to what's being said. Uh, we encourage you um, to engage with us today and participate in those um, opportunities. Okay, let's get going. Jess Hill is an investigative journalist who has been writing about domestic abuse since 2014. Jess's book, got the prop, See What You Made Me Do, won the Stella Prize in 2020 and has been published in the UK and the US. I'd like to note that the fierce and inimitable Helen Garner has said, it's a shattering book, clear-headed, meticulous, driving always at the truth. And I'd say that's a rave review right there. 
The good news for us is Jess still has plenty more to say. Wonderful people of Zoom land, please welcome Jess Hill. Thank you so much, McKenna. It's so lovely to be here with all of you. And I'm sorry that we can't see each other in the same room, but look, it's, you know, it's made these conversations um, more accessible for people who are not in a capital city or in, in, a, in a small room somewhere that we've all, you know, traveled hours to get to. So, um, so I'm really glad to be here. And I just want to acknowledge today, I, I speak to you today from Sydney on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, they're the traditional owners of this land and their sovereignty was never ceded. And I pay respects to the elders past and present and also acknowledge the caregiving that they have given this country, but also modeled in their communities for the past 60,000 years plus. Now we're here today on day seven of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And um, thank you. I mean, all of you lovely people who have been, um, you know, in various states of not so much lockdown in those regional areas, but but certainly in a, in a very stressful position over the last few months, really want to say thanks so much for, for joining us online today. I think it's important, I always find when we're talking about statistics, sometimes the, the a statistic like one in four women have experienced physical sexual violence from an intimate partner since the age of 15. You hear that statistic and you think, gosh, that's a, that must be a lot of people. I remember when I was writing the book, I thought like, okay, well, what, how many people is that? And, you know, here, reading that it was 2.3 million women today who have reported that they've experienced that. So we can probably say at least 2.3 million women today have experienced that. And then like looking at other studies, we don't actually keep national statistics on how many children grow up um, in a domestically abusive household. But some of the smaller studies show that it could be as many as one in four so we could be looking at very similar numbers, which is just astonishing. And I described the experience of being subjected to domestic abuse and living with the ongoing impacts of it as being part of an underground where victim survivors walk among us and walk among each other while their trauma remains unseen, unknown and misunderstood. And, and often not just by the systems that are supposed to protect them, not just by their loved ones, um, but also by themselves. Um, you know, that it's, it's incredibly difficult to understand what you've been subjected to when it doesn't fit your stereotypical ideas of what domestic violence looks like, particularly when physical violence may not have been overt or even if physical violence was overt, but there were so many other aspects to it that that's, drove you crazy you know and and so it's really amazing to me that there's just so many people walking around who've experienced very similar um uh, levels of subjection um who don't have the language to describe it now for centuries those people were basically expected to stay quiet and to just accept their lot and finally i think that time is coming to an end and the underground is really coming to the surface. And we're all starting to really understand what it has been like for our family, our friends, our colleagues to live there and how the systems that we take for granted so often fail to protect them and even place them in greater danger. Now, I know a number of you have worked on this issue for many, many, many years, some of you for decades. And I know some of you, um, well, many of you, probably all of you share my frustration that even in this time when we've got this heightened awareness, when it's receiving sustained media coverage, some good, some bad, we still have a system that is no match for the power and influence that perpetrators wield, not only over their partners and their children, but even over their ex-partners um, and sometimes for decades after that relationship has ended. And I think this is especially true today um, and in the last 24 hours, we've heard news about the killing of two women. Um, one, Samir Dawoodi, who's a refugee from Syria, she, who was new to Australia and was living in Fairfield in, in Western Sydney. She had three kids and they were all new to Australia, all with English, um, not even close to their first language, and whose dad is now in custody, accused of their mother's murder. The second is in Narrawarren in Victoria, and um, a woman there has... Uh, been killed and three others injured, including a three-year-old girl. And it's especially haunting to hear that police have arrested a 15-year-old boy 
um, and in one of those cases, um, that 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 the three that the assault was was quite vicious, and that three year old has been stabbed. So we're in a crisis period, and I think it's important. The other day, I was talking to Royal um, Melbourne Hospital and also to the to the Alfred, and they wanted to know, you know, um, how has COVID nineteen affected domestic violence? And, and we know, that, I mean, COVID nineteen. Um, and and the experience that women have had in this in this time, and any victim survivors, women, children, um, male victim survivors too, that that the violence and the abuse has only been exacerbated. For some, for a large number of people reporting to frontline services, it started something that was not present in their relationship. They're reporting it for the first time. Um, I think the Australian Institute of Criminology found that when they surveyed um, women that 10% of women in relationships right now reported that they had been subjected to physical or sexual violence since COVID began. So we know that during this pandemic, it has gotten worse. Um, and I said, two thirds of those women said the attacks started or became worse during the pandemic. Um, I guess the point though, is that, you know, we've come into COVID out of what was a really a national disaster, which was the bushfires. And we know from, from previous bushfires, previous natural disasters, that you see the same sorts of exacerbation of domestic abuse and coercive control. Um, and I think that when we look at climate change science, uh, it's fairly clear that we're entering an era of what may be a new normal of rolling crises. So what we're seeing come out of COVID, maybe just giving us an indication of the sorts of exacerbated um, conditions that we're going to be living with for the foreseeable future. And so that's, you know, why it's even more important now to be thinking really innovatively and, and with great sophistication as to how we interrupt this violence, how we stop perpetrators from committing it, how we support the independence of victim survivors, both adults and kids, and that we don't just rely on um, old strategies that, that may not have really been serving us well, or hoping that, you know, in years to come, we're going to see um, attitude changes that will, that will prevent domestic violence before it starts. I think that all of the work that we do with children in this area um, and in high schools, especially in Victoria where it's mandated, is absolutely essential. Um, but I think we, we definitely need to be thinking um, in a much more targeted way as well about how we stop the violence now. But, but I think before we talk about how we go about interrupting and preventing this abuse, it's really good idea to get a clear sense of what this looks like. And um, apologies for those of you who understand this better than I do. Um, but I, for those of you whose who's understanding, particularly of coercive control, is a bit patchy, hopefully this just fills in some blanks. Um, I think anyone who's worked in this sector is has been familiar with the behaviours of coercive control because they've seen it again and again. But it's a really notoriously difficult concept to explain um, and to, to get a full sense of. So hopefully, even for those on the call who, who know this back to front, maybe there'll just be a few things in here that will help you um, give you the language to explain it um, if you don't already have that. So this is in heterosexual relationships, an almost strictly gendered kind of domestic abuse, um, aside from rare exceptions. So there can be cases in which females will perpetrate this, but it's, it's very rare. It's often um, when men are at a disadvantage, so disabled men, for example, or if that woman has a particular social advantage, um, if they're in the police force or some way in which they can establish a, a distinct power imbalance. But in same-sex relationships, we can see men and women um, perpetrate this type of abuse. Now, since Ron Baxter murdered Hannah Clark and their three children in February this year, coercive control has actually become a subject of intense media interest. Um, when I released the book in June last year and I started talking about coercive control, if I said, said it to someone in the general public outside the sector, um, people would just look at me like, what on earth are you talking about? And now I mentioned the term coercive control and a lot of people say, oh yeah, I've heard of that. What is that again? Or, or even that they actually understand it. And that's just, that's a, the space of a few months. And this is really, I think, quite revolutionary because what we're talking about when we understand coercive control 
is we're talking about finally really moving away from our incident-based approach of domestic violence to understanding how these systems of abuse, especially in situations of coercive control, actually never switch off. And it's not just about an explosion or an overreaction um, that happens occasionally or even regularly, that all these other behaviours are part and parcel um, of, of the abuse. So the, the emphasis on coercive control is set to intensify because in New South Wales and Queensland and now Victoria and South Australia, they're considering whether to criminalise it. Um, the parliamentary inquiry in New South Wales, it's just been called by the Attorney General, Mark Speakman, uh, it'll report mid next year on whether New South Wales should criminalise. And uh, if they do decide to, um, I think that it will be at least another two years before we actually see um, a law introduced because we're actually likely to see um, that partnered by a, a big implementation effort, um, wide scale training for police and the judiciary. Um, so this will be a much bigger uh, deal than most changes in the law. I know in Victoria, it's still, but not just Victoria, all over the, the country, but particularly in Victoria, it's still quite a divisive idea as to whether or not to criminalise. Um, and, and people have got different, um, different opinions on that. Um, but I think at the moment, there certainly seems to be quite a lot of momentum for at least really investigating whether this is the right thing for Australia. Now, Rowan Baxter has become an exemplar for coercive control because he's shown really exactly how dangerous controlling and degrading abuse can be, and particularly where physical violence is even absent. And I think the fact that what shocked people and I think what brought coercive control to really the forefront of people's minds was to hear that he had, um, there'd been little to no real physical violence in the relationship before that horrific act of violence that took Hannah and their, her three children's lives. Um, and there was this amazing interview with Hannah Clark's parents in The Guardian last week where they listed the coercive controlling behaviours that they were aware of that Ron Baxter used. And I preface this by saying that he was quite overt. Not all coercive controllers are so overt. Um, but even these were not picked up on as, as, as necessarily abusive behaviours because, of course, they didn't know what coercive control looked like. But he isolated Hannah from friends and family. He deprived Hannah of basic needs like food, clothing and sleep. He controlled her daily life, where she could go, who she could see and what she must wear. He prevented her from attending doctors uh, for her medical needs. He belittled her with insults about her figure and her mothering ability. He made up rules for her to obey and then punished her for disobeying these arbitrary made up rules. He stalked her. So he monitored her location using mobile phone tracking devices and, and actually followed her to different locations and turned up like kind of this malevolent presence, like he would stand outside a cafe that she was sitting in and just stare at her. He tracked other members of her family and spied on them and confronted them in public. He'd threatened to kill his previous wife and son, and he'd also threatened to kill himself in order to prevent her from leaving. He printed and shared intimate photos of Hannah and he destroyed um, toys belonging to his children as punishment for them not putting them away. Um, there's so many signs that he exhibited that fit the coercive control plot line. Um, and they're not just red flags for future physical violence or domestic homicide. They're actually incredibly harmful forms of abuse in their own right. Um, and they've been compared internationally um, to forms of torture. So in the media reporting at the moment, we hear people saying, um, reporters sort of getting this wrong, saying things like coercive control um, are the red flags that, that indicate um, potential future physical violence. That might be the case in some relationships. Um, but the point is that actual physical violence um, may happen rarely, not at all. Um, it may not ever breach the, um, the criminal level. It might be a pinch that's just a bit too hard, a slap on the back that's a bit too aggressive that indicates the level of threat that's present. Um, but, but more to the point, actually, physical violence could be the first sign of the abuse. It could be an assault that happens, um, you know, before anything else shows up and then the other behaviours come into play. I mean, often you start to see these behaviours exhibit themselves earlier before any physical assault occurs. But 
it's not that physical violence is what this is leading up to. It's that physical violence may or may not be used in this system of abuse. Same with sexual violence. Now, I think the fact that we've taken this incident-based approach to domestic violence, where we've, we've made it um, the focus of, of our idea of domestic violence largely on physical and sexual incidents. Um, obviously, we've started to change that over the last few years, and, and the sector has been excellent at getting the media particularly and the justice system to recognise that there are, is much more to domestic violence, that it can be psychological, it can be spiritual, it can be emotional, it can be financial. Um, and so we've started to expand that definition. But really what we've only just begun to describe is something that in, uh, most people in the domestic violence sector have known um, for 40 plus years. And that is that more often than not, the abuse in these intimate relationships follows a plot line that is so predictable that you can almost finish a woman's story before she's halfway through telling it. Or you can almost predict what the basic elements are going to be. Okay, you'll have been isolated in some way. You'll have had your access to money probably restricted in some way or your access to independence. You will have been belittled and degraded. You'll probably have made threats either to self-harm or to harm you um, and or the kids or the animals. You know, these are very um, predictable behaviours. Um, and it's so predictable that people say when they learn about this especially victim survivors when they get together in groups are just like did our abusers know each other like did they get together and like mastermind how they were going to do this because they've pretty much all done the same thing i remember being in a um in a room of three or four women in bendigo um at the annie north shelter there with julie oberon and um one of them talked about being um pushed out of bed and it's sort of like, they're all sort of like, oh yeah, I was pushed out of bed too. I was pushed out of bed too. And it's and it's that thing of like, suddenly you realise that like, this is a, a thing that perpetrators do. Why do they do it? You know, this is the, this is the, these are the sort of, sort of confounding questions. And when we see these behaviours appear again and again, um, what we start to be able to do is really map them and how these patterns um how these patterns show themselves. So coercive control is basically the model for understanding what this typical plot line looks like. And really victim survivors often say that when they hear coercive control explained and anatomized, shown all the, the classic behaviors that make it up, it's like this light bulb moment, um, especially for those who never thought of what they went through as domestic abuse, because um, they were never or they were rarely physically assaulted. So, and you know, as, as many of you know, the majority of coercive control victims actually don't know that they're being abused because they're commonly made to believe that they're the crazy ones, they're to blame, and, and they're living in this type of fog where they can't pin down what is, what is actually happening to me um, until maybe after they leave the relationship, they get some clear air and they're actually able to reflect instead of just trying to survive. So coercive control is a system of abuse that never switches off, even during the good times. And essentially coercive controllers dominate their victims by isolating them, micromanaging their behavior, intimidating and belittling them, withholding necessary resources like money or transportation, um, or, you know, obviously committing type, 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 types of fraud, um, siphoning off money, basically um, reducing their partner's ability to access money. Abuse of children and or pets, humiliating and degrading them, monitoring their movements like ringing and texting endlessly or putting GPS trackers or surveillance apps on phones. And we've seen a rise in that. Frontline services have reported a rise in that during COVID. Gaslighting them and creating just this environment of confusion, contradiction and extreme threat. And in, this, in these environments, as I said, physical and sexual violence may or may not be used, but when it is, it's just one of many tools that the abuser is using to gain, gain greater power over their partner, to coerce them to behave in a certain way, to win an argument or demonstrate dominance. And they're often, it's often done to shame the victim. So, you know, those stories where you, you cannot possibly reduce this just to um, an assault necessarily because, you know, a husband will rape his wife and then tell her that he's doing it because she loves it or he got off even more because she struggled or those things that are so degrading that to call it rape alone is not sufficient. Um, that there is, that this is being done in the service of degradation. So 
most domestic violence services will tell you that when they're when they're using the term domestic violence, we're basically describing coercive control because most women won't seek help um, when they just experienced one or a few isolated incidents. They may seek help from police, um, possibly, um, although that's I'd, I'd imagine pretty rare. I think police often walk into a place thinking that they're just seeing a one-off or, or something that's you know um, an overreaction when in fact what they're walking into is an environment of coercive control. Um, so of course it's not all, I mean not all domestic abuse is coercive control and you do have that kind of intimate partner violence that is an overreaction or is a one-off um, or, or it's something that happens and the, the partner gets so freaked out that they that they seek counseling or you know and there's everything under the sun going on out there um but and, and and in that way i think in that overreactive violence or that reactive violence you can see um women committing acts of domestic violence as well um but even though that violence can be um severe and, and look it can occasionally even lead to homicide um, their violence is not as systematic as it is with the coercive controllers. So, you know, you can get those coercive controllers who are very overt, like Rowan Baxter and like others. Um, but for many, what's very difficult is that coercive control is initially masked as caregiving. So it starts with that partner who wants you to text every time you get home, um, not just when you arrive home after a night out, but but even maybe just text where you are throughout the day uh, because they want to make sure that you're safe. And then over time, that morphs into you need to reply within five minutes, otherwise there'll be consequences. Or the partner who persuades you that you should spend time, you like spend less time with your friends and family because they're kind of bad for you. Um, and it seems like that that person's looking out for you but actually what they're doing is they're removing your trust in your supportive connections and therefore they're isolating you in just the same way as the partner who says you can't see friends and family. Or like um, Patricia McLean, who's the ex-wife of the American singer Don McLean, um, who wrote American Pie and various other tracks, he would actually choose the cars she was allowed to drive. He would always lease them in his name. If he walked in and she was on the phone um, and wasn't giving him her full attention he'd go into a rage but even more subtle signs of um dominance were when he would walk in after she'd finished this really long painstaking um artwork she used to do calligraphy and he'd come up behind her and massage her shoulders um and just enough to move her arm so that the work smudged and this is a kind of gaslighting it's where it looks like one thing, but it's actually another. And the victim is double guessing themselves constantly as to why this apparent act of caregiving feels so much like sabotage. And then they're blaming themselves for even thinking that their partner would have done that on purpose, thinking what kind of awful person thinks that someone would come up behind them and give them a massage um, on purpose to, to destroy their work. I must be an awful person to suspect my partner of that. He was just trying to, you know, log in and see if I'm okay and 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 care for me. Um, and in that way, that, that victim starts to doubt their own perceptions, doubt their own instincts, and starts to feel like they are the problem in the relationship, not their partner. But others, you know, who have been through this, they can't even really explain um, even if they know they're being abused, they can't pinpoint what it is that is, is the abuse. And that's because they've actually changed their behaviour already to accommodate the needs of their partner. And one woman I spoke to the other day who writes under a pseudonym and is like very aware that she is living in a domestic violence situation. She has to spend an hour preparing the house for her, her husband um, when he comes home from shift work down to making sure that the mat in the kitchen is in exactly the right place. And the abuse doesn't really occur so much unless she doesn't do that. So women, and, and this I think is especially true for a lot of migrant women um, who come from cultures where that, a certain amount of that behaviour is almost expected, um, and then come to Australia and realise actually that's not expected in this culture, um, who start to say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to spend an hour of my afternoon doing that. And then find that the relationship turns abusive. Um, you know, that's, it's, when they, it's when they don't change their behaviour, when they decide to assert their dignity and their rights, 
they start to um, to experience that abusive side. So I think that's why, you know, rather than understanding domestic abuse as a kind of um, an incident of assault um, or, you know, connected series of incidents, it's really important that we understand this as a form of entrapment. And Evan Stark, who's an American forensic social worker, um, wrote the book Coercive Control, I think published in 2007. He wasn't the first to really identify this term. That was, you know, happened back in the 1970s, a, a bunch of feminist psychologists. Um, but he he really did sort of really outline what this looks like and, and made it, um, I guess, brought it really into common parlance. And he argues that it should be understood as a form of hostage taking. And that even those relatively minor acts of physical abuse, like a slap on the knee that's a bit too hard, a pinch, as I mentioned earlier, can carry a much greater threat than an outsider would be able to infer. And in this environment, the threat is ever present, even when the perpetrator is being nice. And one former perpetrator explained how that works. He said, if you've only got two modes of communicating with someone, one of which is a polite request and the other, which is violence, the polite request is the threat of violence. But when you're the person perpetrating that, you can maintain this self-image of a person who is unfailingly polite while everyone rushes around very quickly um, responding to what you've asked for. So when someone's being coercively controlled, the perpetrator becomes the most powerful person in their life. And in fact, often they can feel like their perspective is being replaced by the perspective of the perpetrator. And sometimes that you know, because they need to second guess what they're going to demand or what they're going to want or what arbitrary rule they're going to set next that they're going to have demanded that they, you know, um, abide by in advance, it's almost safer to see the world through the eyes of your perpetrator than it is to see the world through your own eyes because your own eyes are telling you that something is de terribly wrong. But the situation you're in um, of coercive control is, um, is training you into a type of compliance and a type of loyalty with the perpetrator. And so a lot of women will talk about, um, or anyone who's been through this, for years afterwards, they can hear the perpetrator in their head. And it's like they've become so inhabited by that person. Um, and it's very hard to really convince a victim when they feel so inhabited by this person, when they feel like their gaze is ever present which it actually might be, like they actually may be, you know, technically being tracked, um, that they could ever be safe and that any part of the system could possibly protect them. And unfortunately, too often the system proves them to be right. Um, and by the way, you know, I haven't spoken a lot about kids, but really kids who grew up in a coercively controlling household are experiencing symmetrical um, tactics and, and behaviors of coercive control, even if they're not the quote unquote target of them. Um, they may be isolated from their other friends who aren't allowed to come to the house or who when they come to the house, it's just too embarrassing because, you know, dad's going off or, or there's this, this unpleasant feeling in the house and the parents don't want to send their kids over. Um, they can, you know, there's all sorts of ways in, in which children experience this symmetrically, but are also you know, recruited to be um, assets to their one one parent's abuse or are neglected um, by the victim parent because they feel like that, the victim parent feels like that's the only thing they can do in order to keep that child safe because when they give that child attention, the perpetrator punishes them and that child for not giving the perpetrator enough attention. You know, so there are so many things that kids experience and the harms of that are equal as we've found in research in the UK to them witnessing actual physical violence or experiencing physical or sexual abuse themselves. So I think it's also really important. I remember seeing definitions of how, how can you tell that you're living in domestic violence as opposed to, you know, just living in um, with a bad relationship, you know. Um, and one of the distinguishing factors was that the victim will feel a sense of fear. And I sort of come over the time to, to question that because I think that while a lot of people do, victim survivors do feel fear, I think there's all sorts of different emotions, especially early on, which can be anger, it can be frustration, um, it can be a, just a raw determination to fix this relationship or to fix the person who's acting so differently to when you first met them. Um, but also it can be a blocking, because you're so used to not responding to your own needs, 
that feeling of fear may not even register with you because what that fear actually tells us is that something is wrong. And a lot of victim survivors will rationalize their abuse in order to survive psychically and physically to sort of like almost forget, you know, hours after a physical abuse incident has occurred or to just make excuses for why it's occurred. And so to actually admit that you felt fear um, would be like admitting that there was something wrong. And then what comes from that is like, well, does something need to change? You know, do and and who is making me feel afraid? So I think that it's, they're all of those things make it very difficult to identify actual fear for some people um, until, until it's already a dangerous situation. Um, and I want you to consider this comparison, you know, in terms of us understanding why it's so vital that we change our frame on how we think about domestic abuse and what kind of abusive behaviors we classify as the most severe. And I was talking to this psychologist um, a few uh, a few days ago, maybe weeks ago now, because time during the 16 days of activism just seems to draw expand. Um, but she works at a psych ward at a hospital in Wollongong. And she told me that last year she had at least four women admitted to hospital by their husband for three weeks of intensive psychiatric treatment. And these women all told her that they were anxious, they were depressed, they had no friends, they were terrible to live with. But when she dug a little deeper and actually asked them what was going on in their relationships, they revealed that they were being horrifically abused and controlled by their husbands. Now, these men had essentially gaslit these women so relentlessly that they were convinced they were losing their minds. And in three of these cases, when the women came out of hospital, they returned home to, home to find their husbands had changed the locks and had initiated family court proceedings. Now, in one woman's file, the doctor wrote clearly that there was no evidence whatsoever of mental disorder or illness. But when a family court report writer evaluated this woman for her custody dispute, an evaluation that took around an hour, they diagnosed her with borderline personality disorder and recommended that sole custody be granted to the father. And that woman ended up losing custody of her children. And that's what women and children are talking about when they talk about the physical violence alone was not the worst part. It's absolutely imperative that people start to understand what how severe coercive control is and and start to understand that when we're talking about all the different harms that it can occur in in coercive control that we don't need to make it a pyramid in which one is up the top and the others are a subordinate that this is a system of abuse that includes all different types of harms that basically end up either eroding or completely overriding someone's autonomy to the point where women will look in the mirror and not even be able to recognize themselves anymore, to the point where children are raised in a constant environment of betrayal and hurt so that they come to expect that throughout their adult lives. This is an extremely serious form of abuse that we must be giving greater signals to the public is unacceptable. And at the moment, a lot of men who perpetrate this abuse would not even probably identify those behaviours as a form of domestic abuse. As one perpetrator said, when he was sitting in a men's behaviour change program, aside from the physical or sexual acts of violence, 95% of the men who were present could not name those other parts of coercive control as domestic abuse. They just did not even know that that was the case. Um, and they just felt <laughs> a level of entitlement or a level of socialization that made that normal for them. So I think that it's where we're at now, you know, looking at why does he do it? How do we intervene? You know, I really felt like it's, and I think we're starting to do this much more now, that we need to take the two sort of predominant models for understanding men's violence and why they do this. Why do they act so psychotically in their relationships, even when they themselves are not psychotic? And why do they, why do they meet their needs through behavior that is sadistic? Um, and what we've got as two dominant strains of thought ex explaining that is the feminist model, which asks, why do men abuse? And the psychopathology model, which says, like, why does this man in particular abuse? There must be something wrong with him or there must be something in his history that explains this aberrant behaviour. And 
both approaches are essential. I think neither approach explains or gets to the nub of things entirely on its own, but both approaches um, are essential. And that's because men aren't just imprints of patriarchy and gender socialization. They're like all of us. Uh, they're complex systems formed by DNA, formed by upbringing, social milieu, and of course, patriarchy. Um, but what we need to understand is, is that these are complex people with complex histories um, that, that share things in common, uh, like, for example, you know, overblown senses of entitlement, even if they're invisible to that person, a radioactive victim complex, and also so often in these guys, a sense that they are on a trigger, a hair trigger for humiliation, for being disrespected, for not getting what they deserve. And when they feel thwarted, they get triggered into this type of humiliated fury, which I think is a really important term for us to understand. Um, and too many men are on these hair triggers around being thwarted, around being disrespected and humiliated because they themselves have been fundamentally disconnected from their like emotionally embodied selves. And they don't really have a sense of real self-love or self-worth. Um, so you get these guys who have this grandiosity, narcissism, victimhood. It's this habituated defense that's been built up against being exposed, um, a defense against being seen for who they are, which they believe is unloved, unlovable, um, and they're against being known. And that can start in boyhood. And who poses the greatest threat to this? An intimate partner. Because in intimacy, the whole point of it is to go backstage, go behind the mask, go behind the gloss, and to see each other for who we really are. And so many women will go into these relationships. They want to get inside that person and, and really reconnect with that open-hearted little boy who they once were to make him believe in love, believe in trust, believe in intimacy. And women will drive themselves to the edge of sanity and beyond trying to reach that little boy, <clears throat> all the while absorbing his pain and rage and neediness and dependence. And of course, that neediness and dependence, which can make um, which can make them resent her even more and be even more sadistic towards them. And of course, shame in and of itself does not necessarily lead to abuse. But what we see operating in so many men is not just shame, but this sense of toxic shame combined with entitlement and this humiliated fury that one is entitled to certain treatment, entitled to be the sole focus of the woman's intention, entitled to sex, entitled to care, acceptance, and ongoing devotion um, of a partner he often degrades and surveils and humiliates. Um, and that's, that's the difference between women who are humiliated and shamed, as so many women are, um, who don't go and behave like this, is that men feel, abusive men particularly, feel this entitlement to power. And so it's humiliation plus entitlement, the sense that I don't feel the type of power that I should um, and I'm going to use this behavior in order to get back that sense of power and dominance. Um, and I think that it's very important as we, as we really start to explore how do we interrupt this violence, that we think about how do we connect with men who see themselves as victims, with men who feel this sense of unacknowledged toxic shame, who cannot connect emotionally, who may use emotion to manipulate their partners, and who may in their like genuine moments, be emotionally connected to them, but then may feel a sense of disgust in themselves that even having exposed that. This is the sort of merry-go-round that, that perpetrators and victims are on. Um, so, you know, there are answers. <laughs> I think there are solutions that have worked here and around the world to really interrupt this. Um, but, you know, when we're thinking about links between gender inequality and family violence, I think it's really important that we be sophisticated in our understanding of whether gains in gender equality will necessarily bring about a reduction in domestic abuse, how it is that we can, um, that like why it is that we're getting this violent backlash from some men. Um, you know, think about incels that have gone off on murderous um, shooting sprees, um, the online trolling of women. You know, there is a backlash at work that we need to be more sophisticated about confronting because at the moment, you know, you're getting phone calls into safe steps with women saying, can you take that domestic violence ad off the TV? Because when he sees it, he goes nuts. 
you know, there's something that we're missing about addressing men. I don't know. Maybe it's impossible. Um, maybe backlash is inevitable. But I feel like there's some there's some way that we can be more sophisticated in our approach. And I think we have to be. Um, and it's not about whether men should be molly cold. Men should accept the advance of feminism. Men should accept the amplification of women's voices. Of course, all the shoulds are fantastic. And I believe in all those shoulds. But the shoulds aren't converting into reality. And we have to ask questions as to why. But anyway, I'll leave some time for more questions about various things and um, and hand over um, back to our moderators. Thank you very much. Wowzers, Jess, you really covered a lot of ground. Thank you for the evidence and the detail. I found that um, intriguing and so interesting. And you touched on so many points that I would love to pick up now and discuss with you. Um, I found a particularly notable the comments that you made about coercive control working its way into our vernacular and that it's the, the growing understanding of its severity and the varying harms that it can occur. And um, many of us that are joining this conversation today um, are working in this space. If it's not in prevention, it's in response or anywhere in between with that. So I thought those are really interesting comments um, to hear about and learn more about. Um, speaking to that, uh, I wonder if you have any comment around the prevention space. You just spoke a little about um, addressing men and perhaps the role that gender equity plays in that, the work that we can do wherever we drop in on the spectrum with that, wherever we fall in with the continuum about where we bring in gender equity and those conversations. Um, you also mentioned interrupting what's happening and you know we're working on the prevention and the interrupting, but I'm just wondering if there's anything really obvious to you that um, you think could be shifted or changed within the system um, mm. to get that humming, to get that moving along. Yeah, I think that, I mean, for me, obviously, I mean, the attitude work and the cultural change work is the long-term work, and that's the work that's being done in schools, and it's and it's also um, being done in in various ways in council programs that that um, that run programs for dads with parenting. You know, there's all these different types of ways in which um, in which men are being encouraged and helped to facilitate living those emotionally embodied lives, and that is, I think, a big part of prevention. Um, in terms of yeah, the cultural change item, I think we have to be really careful that we don't address a lot of our cultural change messages to victim survivors or, or go along that should line, um, which is to say that I think that more work needs to be done in understanding what messages are gonna get through to men who don't see their um, behavior as a problem some men do who are using abuse. Some men do see their behavior as a problem or they can in their honest moments reflect on that. Um, but for those men who think of themselves as victims, um, it's an incredibly difficult, if you're sitting down with an ad agency saying write a, write a campaign that, that talks to men who think they're victims to show them that they're actually perpetrators, like, man, you want to be paid a lot of money um, to communicate to those that, that audience. But I think that similarly difficult campaigns have been run around smoking you know, um, and and so on that public sort of awareness level, I think there are probably better ways to get through to guys, both who are perpetrating this abuse, but also guys who can who can really play a role in communicating to their friends and family who may be perpetrators. I think that there's probably better ways to get through to them than we're doing right now. Um, and part of it, I think, is to understand some of that shame, um, that shame part. I think it's really interesting also to just note that, you know, um, in some of the countries that score the highest in gender equality still have incredibly high rates of domestic abuse and sexual violence. Um, so Iceland, for example, you know, commonly scores number one on the gender equality index, has incredible stuff around equal pay, high numbers of women in parliament, and yet one in four Icelandic women says they've been raped or sexually assaulted. And the system is incredibly bad at responding. I think 12% of sexual assault um, victims in Iceland report because the system is so weighted against them. Um, and it's what's known across various Scandinavian countries as the Nordic paradox. And it's looked at as symptomatic of a growing backlash from certain men over the advancement of women's rights and the amplification of female voices. Um, and there's this incredibly dangerous sense of alienation that's filtering through to young men um, to uh, being supercharged by habitual consumption of violent 
and degrading porn, I have to say. Um, not that everyone who watches porn is watching violent and degrading porn, but it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a large amount of it that is. Um, and there's these frustrations where quite, um, I mean, not rightly, you know, men are feeling like they are now being discriminated against, that women have all the power, you know, because actually, as someone, you know, famously said, like, to oppress is equality can feel like oppression. Um, and that's something that's that that's just something that's true that we need to be dealing with. How do we deal with this sense of alienation better? Um, because just by saying men should man up and or hopefully not using that term, but men should men should actually just deal with the advancement of women's rights and, and their amplification of their voices. Well, absolutely. I agree with that. But that's not actually what's happening. And you've got, you know, really violent subcultures germinating online. And a lot of that is getting through to young boys um, who are feeling like they're getting the um, the rough end of the stick, um, you know. So that's part of it. I think that also that part of it is whole of community approaches are really needed if we're going to make substantial inroads into reducing violence now. And justice reinvestment, focused deterrence, a couple of the strategies I talk about in the book. The only way to really <clears throat> get a hold of this is to bring in every part of the system that responds to domestic violence or domestic abuse, family violence, um, and get them to work together. Because the siloed approaches, as Victoria has been finding, you know, and has been revolutionising, um, the siloed approaches don't work. Um, and they just see a repeat of the same violence over and over. Um, so that's a big part of it. And every time I speak to like a city council area or whatever, I really talk to them about the details of what justice reinvestment looks like, what focused deterrence looks like, and the fact that actually it only took one person in Burke in New South Wales, for example, Alastair Ferguson, who was a fair seniority in the community, to say, that's enough. We're going to we're gonna replicate a model that I've seen work in Texas, you know, in a, in a predominantly Indigenous community, um, and who then, and then work to bring the community together to do that. It was one police officer in High Point, North Carolina, who said, enough enough of the homicides, um, we're going to make um, this our number one public safety issue and then looked to some other strategies that were working and chose focused deterrence. So we're really talking about one person can make this decision and find those people in the community who are in leadership positions to really to, to make this happen. You don't have to wait for state governments, you don't have to wait for federal governments to do this for us. In fact, it won't, that won't happen you know, because actually at that community level, you're talking about councils, you're talking about community groups, and that's where it has to start, I think. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, really interesting point that you made around the old uh, theory versus practice conundrum, and many of us working in that and trying to bring those dots closer together and, and to challenge that. Um, also really encouraging to hear and to have affirmed the concepts around that collaborative whole of community approach that I know absolutely you're right that Victoria is trailblazing and has spearheaded a lot of that work across the state and this certainly is occurring in our own region here so a lot to be proud of around that. Mm. Um, further on the coercive control, um, how can we best work do you think to orchestrate to change laws and the understandings around co coercive control across that continuum so in regards to the police and the legal system and the courts and the public how do you think we might be able to address that small question um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um look what i think is that no response will be perfect um i think that what i've what i've noticed across the uk and i'm actually speaking to the specialist prosecutor um, for domestic violence in scotland um, in a few days to find out how she's prosecuting these coercive control cases in Scotland where it's illegal. Um, and essentially what, what has made Scotland the example that anyone who advocates for criminalisation here look to was that the laws were written in collaboration with the women's sector and very much with victim survivors, both adults and kids, um, and that that happened over a, a, a good period of time. They they started talking about criminalising in 2015 when England and Wales did. It didn't actually become, um, it didn't be, get introduced till 2019. It shows you that level of consultation that occurred. And I think New South Wales is at the, at the front end of starting that now, if, if, it, if it actually goes through. Um, 
And then what happened is that they they recognised that implementation was as important as the legislation, and they trained in person every police officer, and they trained uh, members of the judiciary. But they also like did things like looking at the whole system of why is it that police can't can't or don't um, investigate these incidents properly or these or the call outs I should say properly. And a lot of the time it was because they were being rushed on to the next job. So they trained the call out operators on what coercive control is and why they need more time to investigate it. So they looked at it from this whole systemic approach. Um, now, you know, you'll still get, as Marsha Scott from Scottish Women's Aid said, you'll have police who have been champing at the bit to properly investigate these crimes. Um, and now they've got the offence. They can actually go and arrest someone on a charge of criminal, of coercive control. Then you've got police who will get a really overt case reported to them and say, well, that just sounds like a bad relationship to me, you know. Um, so it's not like you've just suddenly magically reformed the system. But what you do have is a much greater number of police who understand this, thanks to the amazing training from Safe Lives. And you have a judiciary that is primed to understand it. You've got specialist prosecutors who understand it. Um, and you've got actual evidence being introduced to court that is more than just the incident itself that shows the ongoing system of abuse through text messages, through financial records, through testimony from friends and family, if that's appropriate, that, that, that they were isolated, um, through so many different avenues to prove this. Whereas if you're just looking at an incident, you're just trying to prove what happened that night. And you might actually have a woman who has acted in violent resistance after being abused for years, where she can't claim self-defense but she's assaulted her partner and that's a criminal assault. Now, if you've got coercive control being investigated, it becomes clear that that woman is acting in retaliation to an ongoing system of abuse. But if you're just mandated to in investigate the incident, those questions won't be asked. They won't be asked as to why she did it because it's not important. That's not what's being investigated. So that's, that's why, I mean, I advocate for criminalizing coercive control, not because I want to fill jails with perpetrators, um, but because I want a very clear signal to be sent to the community. I want the police and the courts to actually much better understand what they're looking at and what they're dealing with. I want the high risk perpetrators to be identified rather than just showing up as like, you know, low level destruction of property or whatever that they go into court for at the moment. Um, and I want the media to start reporting as they report on crime. If they start reporting on the crime of coercive control, you can bet your bottom dollar that within a few years, the general understanding of coercive control will be through the roof across the community. A comment that you made earlier that it's almost scripted. It's almost so, it's so predictable with how that it's going to roll out. All those hallmarks are sitting there that if we just tune into that, we can potentially interrupt and do something about that mm -hmm. before it gets to those worst case scenarios that you spoke of today in your address. I'm very aware of time crunch, but I just wanted to ask you um, a question around gender binary and how that contributes to family violence. And how do you think our society perpetuates and upholds the gender binary? Yeah, it's a really difficult one. And, and it's... Yeah. It's vexing because when I was writing the book, I was just trying to like sort of incorporate so many different lenses. Um, and for me, I had to make a, a choice about what am I really going to focus on here? And I had to make the choice to focus on men's violence against women. Obviously, I mean, throughout the book, I acknowledge that, that this is uh, very similar cases happening in same-sex relationships or for non-binary people. And indeed, you know, amplified for, for trans women, um, and, and other people who are, who are in, in those minorities. So the gender binary absolutely does reinforce it. And we actually, you know, I see gender queer movements and that sort of thing as a, one of the, the, the front guard movements against patriarchy. Um, and then at the same time, it's still a political act to name men's violence against women. So how do you get in between there? Like, and I guess what we're trying to do is try to do both. Um, that yes, you know, the gender binary is problematic in the way that we describe this and, and deal with it. Um, but also we do live in a world in which most people occupy that gender binary um, at the moment. So I don't have the perfect answer for that. In fact, I'd, be, I'd love to hear <laughs> people explain how we do both. Um, because I think we're still, when I was in the book writing, you know, putting the perpetrator first in the sentence. So instead of you know, Mary got killed, it's John killed Mary, as Jackson Katz does, you know, in his work, putting that perpetrator first. 
So naming men's violence against women instead of violence against women, it still felt like a political act. I still had to resist all the instincts to invisibilize the, the perpetrator. Um, so we've actually sort of only just at the beginning of even naming men's violence against women. That's what makes this so difficult. So I think we need more work on how to be inclusive in that language without losing that political framework. What a powerful point to be wrapping up on with an author of the power language. Absolutely. It was a curly one at the end, but thank you for that. Absolutely. Fantastic to hear um, those anecdotes that you have shared with us supporting the um, prevalence and the, pre the potential prevention of violence against women that we know that it exists in all, all our communities across not just where we're living and where we find ourselves now, but across the planet, unfortunately. Yeah. But thanks so much, Jess, for those insightful and thought-provoking um, comments. We really appreciate it. Uh, we are on time, so I'm going to wrap up now. I just wanted to acknowledge the partnership between Women's Health London Mallee and Greater Bendigo Against Family Violence and see you, Greater Bendigo, and thank Greater Bendigo Against Family Violence for their efforts and commitment in initiating this event. You know who you are. We appreciate the work that you've done. Um, we want to always remind everybody that 16 Days of Activism wraps up on the 10th of December, and we encourage you all to continue to support the critical activism wherever you find yourself. And we spoke earlier about having um, opportunity now to get further afield than we may have once, given our online networks and activities that are prolific at the moment. Uh, I think that's the end of our conversation today. Thank you to everybody that's joined us. A big thank you again to Jess Hill for um, sharing her insight and all the research that she's done and the intelligence around um, preventing violence against women and moving towards, um, you know, hopefully a world where we're able to minimise that. Um, thanks, everybody. Go well. So much, everyone. Bye.